Hoffman, and today we're talking with Lasonia Moore. How are you, Lasonia? I'm fine. How are you? Uh, I'm very good. Glad you uh, are going to participate in the book. You're very welcome. Uh, would you mind telling people who you are and what you do and all about you? Certainly. Well, first off, my name is Lasonia Moore. I'm an um, administrator, a sixth grade assistant principal in Pinellas County Schools. I'm the mother of two wonderful young men. I have a 21-year-old son and a 14-year-old son, Marquise and Mesnari. I have a wonderful husband. Um, as a young girl, I grew up in South St. Petersburg um, in Pinellas County. I'm also a product of Pinellas County Schools. I graduated from Boca Ciega High School, mm -hmm. um, where I went on to um, go to um, college at St. Petersburg College and transferred over to the University of South Florida where I got my bachelor's degree and then um, to get my master's degree as well um, and where I'm at now is the University of South Florida. All right. Well, about me. <laughs> thank you for that introduction. I really don't know much about you at all. If you had to describe some of your qualities, what, what, what's on that list? Um, if I had to describe some of my qualities, I would have to say that I'm an extremely outgoing person. I'm a very passionate person. I'm a very driven person. Um, those are some of the things that I would say describe the most about me. Um, very caring person um, and very motivated. Mm -hmm. When you say motivated, what exactly does that mean for you? Motivated means to me that I'm very driven um, about goals and passionate about the things that I do. Um, driven in the opportunities in life that are given to me. I want to take full advantage of those and to assure that I maximize every opportunity that comes my way. And also, not only maximizing opportunities that come my way, but trying to help others maximize opportunities that, that may come their way as well. So I think that's kind of what I mean as driven. Well, you said something that's really interesting to me. You said you want to maximize the opportunities that are given to you. Are you the type of person that waits for things to happen? I, I'm not getting that impression. No. You sound like the, you're the person that decides what they want to do. I am. I am. I am very, um, I, am, I am certainly one of those person. I'm a go-getter, is lack of a better term. I'm a go-getter. I don't wait for things to happen. But when things do happen that come my way, I certainly take advantage of those things. But I'm also a person that goes out and make things happen as well. Um, I take every opportunity that I can. I get teased a lot that, you know, most people plates get full. I don't usually have a plate. I usually have a platter that continues to get full. Um, but I do. I seize every opportunity that comes my way, sometimes a little too much. Um, but I do. I'm blessed, and I, I am thankful for the opportunities that I have. So I try not to um, miss an opportunity. Well, how did you get started in education? Well, that's an interesting story. I actually um, didn't think I was going to be an educator. I always actually wanted to be a child psychologist. That was actually my dream. I always kind of knew as a little girl I liked helping people and I liked having conversations with others about their issues and trying to help them understand their issues. Um, but in high school, I had a, a great science teacher, Dennis Crenshaw, that just, I, I love what he did and I love what he did for me as a student. Um, and that kind of is where I kind of started to see myself go down to this educational path. Um, still not taking it very seriously that I wanted to be an educator. Um, I still kind of pursued that psychology path. And then when mm -hmm. I got into college, um, the passion for um, educating others kind of stuck with me. And that passion that he had instilled in me of helping other students like myself and I was very focused on the fact that how he helped me grow as a student and into part of the leader I kind of am today. Um, so that's kind of what pushed me into that direction is having someone there to support me and seeing what that person did for me and wanting to pay that forward for the next students or students that I came mm -hmm. involved with in my life. So what would happen if he wasn't there for you? Think you'd wind up in a different direction? I probably would not be an educator. I probably would be something very close to it, um, more so in the psychological field. Um, I do believe I would still have some of the um, educational characteristics that I have today, mm -hmm. as in wanting to help others, needing to help others. Um, I'm very driven when I have to have I have to feel needed, so I enjoy helping others. Um, I do feel that I probably would be very close to the educational field, um, 
but he definitely helped guide and mold me mm -hmm. into that direction as to where I'm at. Do you think everyone needs somebody like that person in their life? Absolutely, absolutely. And I would have to say that, you know, not only Dennis Crenshaw, but Kathleen Ryburn was also, those are two teachers that just stuck out of my head in high school that really pushed me in that direction. I think every, every person, every child, every adult needs someone to help them grow and kind of um, nurture them down that path that they're trying to take that they may be unsure of themselves. Well, Lasonia, you mentioned in your introduction that you came from Pinellas County. What kind of school district or school system was that? Could you describe the neighborhood? Um, the person that you see here today, Dr. Hoffman, is certainly a very different person um, that grew up as a child. Um, I came from a very urban area. I grew up in a very poverty-stricken area. My mom was a single parent. Um, I really didn't know my father much at all. Um, I have a two sis I have a sister and a brother and then two stepsisters. We grew up very poor. Um, I grew up in what most people would call the ghetto um, in St. Petersburg. That would have been Jordan Park, which is a very um, difficult area to grow up. Um, lots of violence, lots of um, drugs, lots of issues in the community. Um, lots of adversities that I've had to grow through and to deal with as a young um, lady growing up. Um, as a young girl, I, I grew up um, with my mother and my grandmother um, taking care of me most of my life. Um, that was very difficult to do, but I also had other supports in my life mm -hmm. as well, uncles and aunts that helped me with that as well. Growing up as a young girl, was in, in the projects, per to say, was not easy. And it's not easy for any young child growing up, but well, you seem to have turned out really well, and you seem very, very satisfied with your life. How do you explain the fact that you were able to become a professional woman despite those environmental and neighborhood concerns that you had and the type of culture you grew up with in? Well, I will tell you this. Um, internal strength and support and motiv intrinsic motivation um, I have always been a type of child, not only adult, but a type of child that has a no-quit attitude. Mm -hmm. um, at the person, as I said, you see sitting here today, I grew up, my, I, I, in high school, I had my son at 17 years old, um, didn't miss a beat of high school, continued, graduated at 18 years old, continued. So you had your son while you were in high school? Currently, right. absolutely. I had my son while I was in high school, did well, not stop going to high school. That must have been fairly traumatic for you, I would think. Um, it was definitely a struggle, very difficult, but I had a wonderful, um, my son's father was wonderful. He was always there, never left mm -hmm. my side, who is now my husband now, who I have been married been married to for over 20 years now. So it was um, a opportunity that I took upon myself to say, this is not going to make me or break me. So I was, once again, I was just a very driven person that simply because we have obstacles in our life, we don't let that stop us. So we need to continue to move forward. And not only did I have a younger brother and a younger sister that I was a role model for, I needed to also show them that I had a no quit attitude. And things happen in life. Things happen in life and we can't let that knock us down. So, so we need to continue to move forward. Sounds like having a child still in high school, that wasn't much of an obstacle for you. It, it, it was an obstacle, but it wasn't an obstacle. I did mm -hmm. not allow it to become an obstacle. It was certainly an obstacle as in the fact that it was difficult to be a single parent raising a young son at the early age of 18. Um, certainly as difficult for any teenage mother, um, but having, once again, those supports on my side and having um, a very... Um, forceful attitude and not willing to give up mm -hmm. or say no certainly did not allow me to stop and, and give up on anything. Well, you said early on that your role as an educator is to help other people. Correct. If, assume you were speaking to a 17-year-old student that grew up in similar circumstances to yourself. What kind of advice would you give that person? If I was speaking to a young lady that was 17 years old and that was in a situation that I was in, I would definitely tell her there are supports out there 
you have to be very vigilant about looking for those supports. You can't give up. You have to be very driven. If there's something you want, you just continue to tell yourself that it's going to happen. And you don't say no. You don't ever say no. And you don't let anyone tell you no. And you never let any of the naysayers push you back. I've had many people in high school, such as guidance counselors, to say, you're going to end up on welfare. You're going to be a single parent end up on welfare. It's not going to happen. I have never been on welfare a day in my life. Anybody ever say that to you? Absolutely. I've had people say that to me. Then what do you say to them? And I said, I can guarantee you it will not happen. And it did not happen. I sit here you today, never been on welfare a day in my life. I have supported my son as well as his father throughout our entire lives. I have been driven to move forward and move away from the statistics that they may have thought I would have been. And I, pr I, I prove people wrong every single day of my life. And that is my goal to continue to do. Not only to prove people wrong, but to prove to me that I know I can be in anything that I want to be and continue to move forward. Are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it to show other people I'm not what only, you can accomplish? I'm not. I'm doing it for myself, but most importantly, I think at this time in my life, I'm doing it for my children as well. I have two wonderful sons, as I stated. A 21-year-old son that's a freshman in college and I have a 14-year-old son that's a freshman in high school. And I would have to say all of my efforts and everything I do right now is a lot of what I do for myself, but it's 90% of what I do to show my children that they can do anything they put their minds to. Okay, Lasagna. I have a, what I think is a tough question, okay. at least for me to answer. Maybe you can answer it. I'll try. But even as a professor and somebody that studies motivation and writing a motivation text, I can't really figure out the motivation of some of those young people today. They seem to be attracted to all the things that I consider to be almost evil, <laughs> certainly not helpful for them to be successful citizens like yourself. Seems to be a lot of negative role models out there. You see them on TV every day, you open the newspaper, you don't read about people that have done good deeds, you read about people that have got arrested or scandals or something. So how can we stop young people from being attracted to what I consider negative role models? I don't think um, we can ever stop it. I think we can be proactive and put people and things in place so that students and even adults see that they're, it's okay to be educated. It's okay to have common sense and book sense as well. Street smarts aren't the only smarts that will get you somewhere in life. Um, television publicizes negative role models on a daily basis. It's not cool to be educated. It's not cool to be smart. Right. So we need to put that out there more. It's okay for you to be smart. It's okay for you to want to and desire to learn. That's okay. It's perfectly fine. I think the more that students see um, professional and appropriate role models, the better we off with those particular students. Students don't see a lot of people like myself, nor do they have the opportunity to sit down and have conversations like myself. I'm not making a million dollars a day videos that they can watch me on and say, hey, look at me. No, they don't get to see that, unfortunately. What they do get to see is those negative role models on a day-to-day -day basis, sadly. Mm -hmm. Well, I find that most students don't even really value education the way you and I do. How do we get that message across? They seem to think it's almost like a waste of time. It doesn't matter. I don't need to be educated to be successful. Some people do think that way. Some people do think that way. I think I, it is my sincere hope, because I am an optimist, it is my sincere hope that most people don't think that way. And I think if we looked at the root cause of it, most students and their parents want their most parents want their children to be educated. They want their children to grow up and be better than them. I think any parent would step up and say, I always want my child to be better than me. I know I say that on a daily basis. I tell that to my boys often. You will always be better than me. That is my ultimate goal. But most parents don't know how to do that. So you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And we need to help parents understand how do we transfer that information from the parent to the student. If parents, under, parents value education, parents value their students' learning, but how do they transfer that over to their own children to let them understand that? Well, that's a good question. How do you do that? I think. What, what tips do you have for parents? I think most critical is having those authentic conversations with your children and letting them know, guess what, I am here for you no matter what you need. Whatever supports are out there, we can find it together. Helping them to understand that it's okay 
to learn daily. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to associate yourself with those individuals that know more than you do. I always tell my own sons, I want you hanging out with people smarter than you. Mm -hmm. I hang out with people smarter than me because guess what? If they're smarter than me, then guess what? I'm learning daily. So I always want to share that information with them. Parents need to understand that as well. They need to have not to be afraid to sit down and have authentic conversations about education with their students or their children. Okay. Well, that's really great advice, Lasonia. Um, you seem to be really driven. You're like the, the motivation person. <laughs> Your entire life, it seems, has been like just one big rhinoceros charging bundle of motiv motivation. You must have encountered other obstacles besides having a child when you're in high school. What, what kind of roadblocks have you run into oh. trying to be who you are today? I've, I've run, uh, first and foremost, I'm an African American female in a um, Caucasian world. I've run into many roadblocks. I've run into, you know, um, tons of biases. I've run into situations where people mm -hmm. look at me for, not, for, for the color of my skin versus who I am internally. I've run into um, obstacles whereas people look at me as a female and not as worthy as a male. Mm -hmm. um, so I've run into several roadblocks. I've run into the roadblock of being a young teenage mother and you don't know much of anything, whether it's a roadblock in my professional life, whether it's a roadblock in my personal life. Roadblocks are there. Roadblocks will continue to come, but you, it's how you move forward from those roadblocks and learn from those. So you have to understand that they're going to continue to come. I, I'll, I'll give you a little scenario I tell my own children all the time. I say, I'm going to tell you something, and I just want you to understand what I'm saying right now. I'm going to tell you, you're going to go down, you're going to go down this road. And there's going to be a two-by-four about two blocks ahead of you. I want you to be aware of that. About a mile and a half down there, there's a police sitting in the side of that road on the side corner. He's waiting to give you a ticket. Once you pass him, there's a bunch of nails. I saw construction guys working up there. Now, I've given you that knowledge. You have that knowledge. Most of students like me didn't have that knowledge. No one mm -hmm. to give them that information to say, look, sure. here are the roadblocks that you're going to come in life. It's do you, de do you decide to continue to go down that wrong path, get that speeding ticket, hit that two by four, and get those nails in your tire? That's a choice that you have to decide to make on your own. I tell that to my own children. Now, if you choose to go down that road, that means you have to choose to live with those consequences. But if you don't, then understand that you've just been given the advice and the support as right. to understand how to do that. Let's talk a little bit about that prejudice and bias. That's something that many of the people watching this video may not have experienced. How do you deal with that? Well, Dr. Hoffman, that is, I will tell you, that is um, something that I, I want to say is always a struggle. I don't want to sugarcoat anything. Um, I just dealt with that recently, as a matter of fact. Um, I think for the most part, as a young lady, I have grown to understand that back to that same um, statement that I met, made before, people don't know what they don't know, so I kind of take that approach with that whole mm -hmm. situation, and I, it is my sincere hope that they don't know that information. So I think when it happens to me, I'm sent there to make them aware of it. And if they're not aware of it, I try to inform them of it and share information with them and give them some insight as to why that was inappropriate. Um, you said you just something just happened recently. Would you mind telling us about that? Sure. Um, um, I was recently talking with um, someone who made some, some comments, just some general comments about um, different ethnicities, about... You know, when I'm in a classroom, I try to make sure if I'm with some black students, I talk black. If I'm with Hispanic students, I talk Hispanic. Now, I don't think the individual meant to be racist or biased. I think the fact that they don't know that um, there are some biases within that statement was concerning to me. Um, I, I'm not sure what it means to talk black or to talk white or to talk Hispanic slang or in a um, particular manner as to mean that one culture is ignorant over another culture and I think having that conversation with that individual enlightened them to the fact that hmm I didn't mean it that way 
But because that was my perception of the statements that that individual made, that was my reality of that situation. Mm -hmm. So having authentic conversations with people um, that may not understand actually what they're saying is, um, is biased and racial. So if I understand you correctly, then you, you feel for the most part that people that are biased and prejudiced and stereotype individuals just have a general lack of information. They need more knowledge. And once again, being the optimist, <laughs> being the yeah. optimist that I am, I would say absolutely, that is certainly my hope. Being a realist, I would say there are certainly people that right. are not. Um, I live in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood. Um, I chose that by choice for, for many reasons. Um, I, I always tell my children, th they are able to cross the color line, and, and we talk about it often. I don't want them to be subjected whereas they feel only comfortable in an African-American community mm -hmm. or they feel only comfortable in a Caucasian or Hispanic or Asian community. I want them to be able to live in a very diverse world and able to move about and feel comfortable. And my boys are very comfortable with moving about. And they even make comments to me about being, you know, you've made me grow as an individual because I'm able to live in both of these mm -hmm. worlds that we live in. Well, it sounds like you've certainly prepared them for just about anything. I hope they appreciate it. I hope so, <laughs> and I'm sure they do. All right, Lasonia, I have another tough question for you, one that I really struggle to get the answer for. You work in an urban school district. I imagine that there are people from every culture on the planet that come through your office or you have had the opportunity to speak with. I know a little bit about culture, and one thing I know is that people from different cultures have different values, different beliefs, and different ways of doing things. So if you're in a classroom or you have an issue that comes to your attention, how do you get into the head of somebody that has a completely different value and belief structure than your own? That's a very good question. A very difficult question, but very, very good question. <coughs> um, I will say, as an administrator in a very urban and very diverse school, um, that has happened more times than one. Um, my, my population is up over 60% African American students, um, so it's a very um, diverse culture on our campus. Teachers are very passionate at the school that I'm at. They are there, um, I truly believe, because they want to be there, so they have the desire and the need to help this type of uh, urban population. They have motivation? I do believe. <laughs> they have a lot of intrinsic motivation. <laughs> Um, they are very, they are, they too are very driven. Um, but that question has come up because there are some challenges that they do face with understanding a culture unlike their own. Um, currently what I'm doing with, um, a group of my teachers is we're having a book study okay. about, um, African American males and understanding the culture of an African American males and the characteristic that goes along with that and how to educate um, an African-American mm -hmm. male. Um, so you it sounds like you're bridging the cultural divide. Correct. Do you have any particular strategies? I know the book, the book thing is a really good idea, yeah. so you have the opportunity to discuss things with other people that may not have the same knowledge as you do. Anything else? Uh, to be honest, I think the best thing is to continue to have those collegial conversations with those teachers about the different populations and the culture that are there. First and foremost, I would advise any teacher to have conversations with the parents. Get out into the community, see where these students live at, talking to their parents, having those conversations, being in their world. Because it goes back to that old saying, students don't care how many degrees you have or how much you yep. know until they know that you care. So we have to start building relationships with our students and with our parents because you can build a relationship with that student, but you also need to build a relationship with that family. Because once you build a relationship with that family and that student, you have that student. And that's the key part of this whole cultural bridge that we need to do. We have to be able to build authentic relationships. So how do you do that? How do I do that? I can or tell how, what do you recommend be done to create those relationships? First and foremost, you have to be able to put yourself in a very uncomfortable, maybe uncomfortable situation mm -hmm. um, with your students and your families. You have to be able to give of yourself. You have to be able to um, go above and beyond 
contacting parents at their home, you know, contacting students at their home, um, showing them that you care beyond school hours and school days. That takes um, a great deal of effort. Teachers already give so much. They're always giving, giving, giving constantly. But it is a very difficult task to much, to, you know, to who much is given, much is um, required. So we are given a lot. Parents bring their best and their brightest children to our mm -hmm. doors every day. We have to work with the students we have. So we have, in order to do that, we have to be able to have conversations with the students, have conversations with the parents without fear. And I think that is the biggest key that I'm trying to help my teacher understand. What do you mean by fear? By fear, by not showing students or parents that you are fearful. I think a lot of times working with diverse populations, um, if you are not used to working with certain students and certain mm -hmm. populations, that fear factor has a huge um, variance on what is actually taking place with your actions, your words, in your classroom. So we have to kind of remove that fear factor away from it um, and let them know that they're welcome, they're warm, because if students think that you fear them, they're not going to open themselves up to you. You may build a relationship with that student, but I assure you it's not an authentic relationship, and they will see through it faster than anything. That sounds like really good advice, Lasagna. Oh. Are you afraid of anything? I, there are a lot of things I'm afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll talk about the ones that you're afraid of when you're at work. <laughs> When I'm at work, absolutely not. I don't think there's anything I'm afraid of when I'm at work. Um, I'm not afraid of my students, my parents, my teachers, my staff. Actually, I, I actually thrive on day-to-day -day challenges at my school. It keeps me motivated to do what I do every single day. You never get stressed? I do get stressed. I do get stressed. I get stressed when I can't figure out how to help a student or how to help a, f a family member or how to help a teacher. So that stresses me out, my inability to help someone that I know needs my assistance. That stresses me out more so. Okay. Here's another tough one, at least again from my perspective. Stereotypic threat, which happens when individuals think they're supposed to act and believe and accomplish things in a certain way is a really big problem for a lot of young people. How, do, how would you address that problem if people have preconceived beliefs about themselves that are based upon stereotypes? I think, um, first and foremost, um, you know, st students come to us with everything they have. They are, um, for the most part, a product of whatever environment that they're living in. Um, as educators, it's our, I truly believe it's our responsibility to let them know that they are better than whatever they may perceive themselves to mm -hmm. be. Um, if they come into our environment and they perceive themselves that they can't do it, it is our responsibility to en encourage them and let them know that they can do it. Um, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. You can be more than you think you are, but we, they still need that encouragement daily, whether it's encouraging, and, I, and, I, and this goes back to their parents, um, whether it's getting your child out of the neighborhood that they're in, we need to get them out of that situation so that they become better than who they think they can be. My own example, my, I lived in South St. Pete, as I've already stated. I was told that my child had to go to this school, a predominantly African-American school, 89%. I did not want my child in an environment that was only African-American. I wanted him to be extremely diverse. I chose to move into an area that would allow him to be more diverse and acceptable to us so that he could grow as a child and see himself as more than just a black male, to see mm -hmm. himself as a leader. You, you, you are certainly a wonderful mother. There's no question about that. But I think you're the anomaly. Not many people are, are like you. And some of these kids just expect to fail. It's like stamped on their forehead. No matter what I do, I'm not going to be successful. Have you encountered? Absolutely. Because so many students are being told that they can't do it. I, I think we don't see that as adults. I will give you a prime example. A student was just in my office the other day. Not a student of mine, but a student, needless to say. The, the words that kept resonating through my skin, this child kept reiterating, he does not like me. He wants me to fail. He does not like me. It took all my might not to get involved in a situation that had nothing to do with me 
because this child honestly felt that this adult did not like him. So therefore, he felt as if he was going to fail, not only in that situation, but in life. Well, sometimes people do that to insulate themselves. It's not my fault, it's their fault. Did you talk about that at all? Um, this particular young man, I didn't talk about it, but I've had similar situations where I've talked to, to students about situations where they feel trapped. And sometimes students feel trapped, and we have to let them know that there are opportunities. You're not really trapped. You are more than what you think you can be or what, you, or what someone has told you you are. And a lot of times, students leave our general environment, and they're, be, they're being told that they are nothing, that they can't do it. And it's our job to boost them up to let them know that they can. Um, so that's kind of how we need to approach that hole. We yeah. need to take them away from that hole. Sure. Train of thought. Okay, well, if it was up to me, I would nominate you for a Secretary of Education. I don't know what your aspirations are, but what do you want to do next? That is a Professionally, personally, spiritually, <laughs> anything, uh, what's your next goal? What well, do you want to do? Professionally, personally, and spiritually. Wow, all that. Well, what, um, I will. <laughs> I will, uh, first and foremost, continue to be um, the best mother and the best wife that I can be to my sons and my husband. Um, as an educator, my goal is to continue to serve the students that, the most needy students that need me. Um, to, give, to pay forward, to, to, I've been given much. I want to give as much back as much was given to me. I would not be where I am today without the assistance of many, many people, and they know who they are. So my goal is to give back to those individuals, um, to continue my educational track, wherever that may lead me, continue um, and finish my, my doctorate. Um, and when will that happen? Hopefully, um, <laughs> A summer of 2015. Well, it's close. Lord's will. <laughs> so that is certainly um, one of my goals that I see in my near future. Um, but to continue to, I love education. I would never leave education. It is my passion. I do believe I was born and meant to be an educator. Um, so I will continue to be on this fight, whether I'm fighting for my child, your child, or someone else's child. It's where I, I'm meant to be and who I will be. All right. Well, that's great. Well, we're running out of time today. You've certainly shared a lot of valuable information with us, and I really appreciate you taking the time. You're Thank welcome. you. You're very welcome. Thank you.